Starting fresh, Wall Street kicks off a new month on the heels of a rocky September. In today's cover story, the new ways women are raising cash to start companies. Plus, drug stocks react as the first case of Ebola is confirmed in the U.S. And a trader gives up life in the trading pit to take the stage. First business starts now. You're watching First Business, financial news, analysis, and today's investment ideas. Good morning, I'm Angela Miles. It's Wednesday, October 1st. In today's first look, investors brace for Rocktober. Market moving events for the month start with the ECB meeting Thursday and the jobs report Friday. Stocks and commodities ended September and the third quarter with a choppy trading session yesterday. The Dow dropped 28, the Nasdaq 13, and the S&P 6. Gold is just above $1,200 per ounce and oil sank $3.13. The major indices lost ground last month but edged up for the quarter. For the year, the Dow is up roughly 3.4 percent. American Science, which makes X-ray detection systems for airports, is trimming its workforce by 10 percent. The SEC charges two men for insider trading in herbal life after allegedly hearing about activist investor Bill Ackman's short position in the stock. And Yahoo reports $9.4 billion in net proceeds by selling some of its stake in the Alibaba IPO. Larry Trover of SFG Alternatives has his eyes on the market. He's watching the trading day action for us. Larry, good to have you on the show and welcome to a new quarter. Thank you. So what do you see happening here? What's your expectation? Going into the fourth quarter, I see the S&P ending the year at about 2025 based on nothing other than earnings growth, something we've seen all of 2014. Let's talk about this PIMCO punishment that's been happening. As you know, Bill Gross has left the company and now bondholders are very much responding. What do you think is likely to happen from here? Yeah, it's an amazing um, state of affairs that we're seeing at PIMCO, something that maybe is unprecedented. Um, the fact is the money is safe, communication lines are, o um, are open, and I think things will smooth out just given, given some time. Yesterday in the market, there were some stories being floated about as for Russia possibly taking yeah. some extreme measures to rescue the ruble. What do you think is likely to happen there as well? They have a lot of things at their disposal. And one thing is very fascinating, if you've noticed yesterday, all asset classes basically went down except for gold. The market might be thinking that Russia will continue to buy some gold into the reserves to help support the ruble. That might be one of the drastic measures they take. Thanks for coming on the show this morning, Larry. You're welcome. It's here. The first case of Ebola has been confirmed in Dallas, Texas. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports the patient was in West Africa, returned to the U.S. and developed symptoms and is now in strict isolation. Investors are responding by aggressively buying shares of Tecmira. The Canadian drug maker has an Ebola treatment in the early stages of development. Shares rallied 23 percent after the close. Sarepta gained 7 percent. That company is also developing a drug for Ebola. Diane Mocha is filling in for Chuck Coppola today. Diane, a big day is ahead for General Motors. Angie, investors are keeping a close watch on General Motors stock today as CEO Mary Barra prepares to take the company in a new direction. The CEO of the automaker is unveiling a multi-year financial strategy at an investor meeting today. Her vision will include specific financial targets and new lines of vehicles. Barra is hoping to convince others the company is on the path to stellar profit despite its recent recall scandal. Its stock is trading at $31. A work shift is happening at Boeing. The jet maker says it will move the majority of its defense services work out of Washington state and into other U.S. cities within the next three years. The move is part of an effort to cut $2 billion worth of costs from its defense business. The company has already sliced an additional $4 billion. Boeing's shrinking defense business is in contrast to its booming commercial business. Apple's drama in Ireland isn't going away. The European Commission has drafted a warning to Ireland, accusing the nation of violating tax laws. It says Apple used Ireland as a tax haven, and in exchange, the country provided job security for Apple workers in Ireland. Both Apple and the Irish government denied the allegations when they first surfaced back in June. Over in China, Apple fans can't wait until October 17th. That's when the new lineup of iPhone 6 devices goes on sale. The release was delayed there due to security concerns from the Chinese government.
eBay surprising plan to spin off its PayPal division has a financial world in full tilt, mostly because the CEO of eBay, John Donahoe, so publicly resisted a push earlier this year by activist investor Carl Icahn, who wanted a breakup between eBay and its online payment unit, PayPal. Icahn is getting what he wanted. In 2015, PayPal will be spun off and become a separately traded company. We caught up with tech analyst Rob Enderley, who was on the road near Silicon Valley for his insights. I don't think they had a lot of choice. I mean, at the end of the day, it was a wise choice. I think they, they, they rejected it out of hand because it came from Carl Icahn, and I don't blame them. Anything that comes from Carl Icahn is probably a bad idea if you're a corporation. But in this case, it was one of the rare instances where it really wasn't a bad idea. It was right for the investors, and it was right for uh, for eBay. Speculation is high that another company could buy PayPal. eBay shares spiked more than 7% yesterday, making billionaire Carl Icahn even richer. Icahn owns at least 30 million shares of eBay. Bloomberg calculates he made as much as $180 million when the stock reached a high of $57.30 in yesterday's session. SuperValue gets hit again by hackers. It's the second time since August for the grocery chain, which operates Shop and Save, Shopper Food and Pharmacy, and Cub Foods. The company says hackers installed malware in either late August or early September. It's not known yet if any customer data was stolen. Also, two men who are a part of an international ring that calls itself the Xbox Underground have pleaded guilty to computer fraud. They're accused of hacking the U.S. Army and Microsoft. Walmart responds to Tracy Morgan's lawsuit by blaming him for the injuries he suffered in a car accident with a Walmart truck. The retailer says Morgan failed to wear a seatbelt. Morgan was traveling in a van last June when it was slammed by a Walmart tractor trailer. The collision killed one person and injured Morgan and two others. The Walmart driver was charged with vehicular homicide. It was determined he had not slept for more than 24 hours at the time of the crash. Morgan's lawyer calls Walmart's stance surprising, appalling and disingenuous. Walgreen turns in a healthy performance for the fourth quarter. Earnings met expectations and revenue topped estimates as prescription drug sales jumped. It was the strongest quarterly earnings report in three years. However, Walgreen took an $866 million hit for the quarter due to an accounting charge from its acquisition of Alliance Boots. Yesterday, Walgreen stock fell 33 cents to $59. Several drug companies are out with breakthrough treatments for cancer. Money manager Joseph Parnes of Technomart Investment Advisors likes the chart action of Myriad Genetics. The company has a diagnostic test that is improving the detection of cancer causing BRCA half mutations of women with ovarian cancer. From a financial point of view, the company has no debts of any kind. They just bought another company for 200 and some $270 million. Right now, they're having their cash positions close to 230 to $270 million. Barnes calls a stock a buy and hold position and has a price target of $66. In today's cover story, a growing segment of the small business world is expected to generate $1.4 trillion in 2014. That's a 72% jump since 97. Yet they say they're largely ignored by deep pocket investors. That's why women business owners are instead turning to each other. When women, such as consultant Alexandra Levitt, leave the corporate world to start their own business, the reasons vary drastically, from escaping the glass ceiling, to looking for more work-life balance, to just trying to generate income after getting laid off. But the obstacles they confront are often the same because of their gender. That is something our research has shown, that females tend to have a lower level of confidence than their male counterparts who are small business owners. I had an interesting situation with Center City where I was left out of a lot of rooms. And a lot of venture capitalists, particularly around the time of like a Series A, that first funding, they don't get it, they haven't lived it, so they're going to go fund a beer company instead. CEO Genevieve Thiers says that's what she faced in 2001 when she started SitterCity.com to bring together nannies and parents. Genevieve says it's happening to other female entrepreneurs, especially those seeking funding for companies that solve problems confronted by women, including childcare. It was not something that was looked at as a billion dollar industry. I'm happy to say I'm now rich. It is a billion dollar industry. More than a dozen female business leaders hope to use their success to change the system. Sharing secrets for overcoming hurdles with 500 women entrepreneurs gathered in Chicago for the American Express Open Forum for Women. Started in 2013 with one event and expanded this year to three. The goal? 
To boost the number of women-owned companies, currently about a third of all small businesses. I really believe in paying it forward. I think it's so important to, you know, starting a business is hard. The hard work paid off for Alexa Von Tobel, who was on the cover of Forbes in August and has raised $72 million in financing for her four-year-old financial planning startup, LearnVest.com. Now on to the housing sector where there's plenty happening. Home prices in the U.S. continue to rise, but at a slower pace. The S&P Case-Shiller Index of Home Prices in 20 metropolitan areas increased 6.7% in July. That was just short of expectations of a 7.5% gain. As home prices slow across most of the country, Silicon Valley is hotter than ever. According to Caldwell Banker's luxury market report, sales of homes priced $1 million or more have jumped 76% during the past year. A tight housing market coupled with a slow growth economy are great for landlords. Since 2008, the demand for rental properties has gone up along with rents. 62% of property managers say rents will go up an average of 6% during the next year, according to an annual survey done by Rent.com. 85% of managers say they've already boosted rents this year. Vacancy rates have gone down each year since 2009. China is going to extremes to keep its housing market from cooling off. Chinese officials are allowing 30% discounts on mortgage rates and lower down payments for people who want to buy second homes. It's the first time that's happened since the 2008 financial crisis. Home prices have declined four consecutive months in the Asian nation. Move Inc. is moving on up after a buyout offer from News Corp. Move Inc. stocks shot up 37% in trading yesterday. Media conglomerate News Corp. offered up $950 million in cash for Move, which owns Realtor.com and Move.com, both real estate listing websites. The buyout has been approved by Move's board. And from moving to movies, Netflix is working on its first major feature film. Netflix streams movies and shows to TVs, but now a new Weinstein film, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, The Green Legend, will be shown at select IMAX theaters and premiere on Netflix at the same time. The film's release date is August 28, 2015. Netflix shares flickered to $451. California makes it official. Residents should invest in reusable grocery bags. The state becomes the first in the nation to outlaw single-use plastic bags. Consumers who do not tote their own bag will have to pay a minimum of 10 cents for a reusable one. The plastic bag industry group calls the new law a backroom deal between grocers and union bosses. Turning to the economic calendar for today, it's the MBA Mortgage Index, ADP Employment Change, ISM Index, Construction Spending, Crude Inventories, and Auto and Truck Sales. On the earnings calendar, Acuity Brands and Northrop Grumman. Still to come, will eBay shares continue to catch a bid? Plus, a trader takes his wits from Wall Street to the stand-up comedy scene. And let the good times roll. Why the future is looking bright for high net worth investors. We'll be right back. Wealthy parents are doubling down on education for their children. A new study finds enrollment at private elementary and secondary schools jumped 36 percent between 2007 and 2011. The average annual tuition was around $28,000. Affluent parents are also upping spending on programs that increase college SAT scores. Bill Muller has more on how high net worth Americans feel about the economy. Question, are you bullish on the national economy? How about your local economy? You think the markets are going to keep going up? These are important questions, and they are just the questions that Morgan Stanley regularly asks of high net worth investors. These are the people, of course, with the most money and therefore the most influence on the markets. Stephen Esposito, he's a senior vice president at Morgan Stanley. Okay, Stephen, it's been a good year, and at least in the opinion of this group, it's going to continue to be good times. Absolutely. Uh, right now, high net worth investors, about 84% of them feel the economy will be the same or better a year from now. So that that's pretty confident. I remember what a year ago you were here and they were bullish then. So on the bullish scale, are they more or less bullish? Than oh, they're absolutely more bullish right now going forward. Uh, their, their outlook on the economy, which of course drives their investment uh, philosophy and portfolios going forward. And, and when you've, you've got roughly seven out of eight thinking things will be the same or better, that will drive them to make more investments. Uh, they're not worried about a correction? Well, corrections come and go. I mean, long-term investors that are properly diversified and allocated within their assets, uh, 
you don't worry about these short-term corrections that come. We've had a few of them, about 5% or more each. That shouldn't dissuade you from investing for the long term. If you're a trader, that is a different game entirely. But for the high net worth investors, they're mostly long-term investors in traditional investments that are looking out. And corrections, in many ways, are an opportunity to add to your position. It's interesting because high net worth, that isn't like millionaires and up. That's what? In investable income is like 100000 94% of those uh, investors with $100,000 or more make up the majority of the investing public as far as the amount of assets investable. Is 94%. It the, that's, that's pretty big. Yeah. It's a pretty, pretty big uh, section of the overall investing public. All right, so this group is positive on the markets and the outlook. What do we learn from that? What do we take away from that? As long as rates stay low and the opportunities simply don't exist to invest in other investments that are conservative, let's say, again, if short-term interest rates are at zero for all intents and purposes, they'll be seeking alternative investment opportunities. And as the markets continue, and as their confidence continues to build, and hopefully the economy will gain some steam and momentum, hopefully that'll, that'll bode well for investors in more traditional investments like stocks and bonds going forward. So retail investors should look at this and maybe be a little bit more optimistic themselves about the future of the market. Absolutely. I think you should look at your portfolio on a regular basis, analyze what, what's there, and make sure you're positioned properly for your long-term investment goals and retirement goals by just allocating in the proper investments. Steven Esposito from Morgan Stanley. Thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up, Carl Icahn gets his way as eBay and PayPal decide to break up. So what's next? And a former trader takes his tales from Wall Street to the stage. Meet comedian Raj Mahal next. Thing happened on the way to Wall Street. A big time trader changed careers to become a comedian. Now he's on the way to fame and fortune, making people laugh. Joining us this morning is Raj Mahal. Good to have you on the show this morning. And how much of your material actually comes from Wall Street? Almost all my material comes from my life. So obviously a big part of my life was spent on Wall Street. So I like to mix in as much Wall Street materials as, as, as I can. What can you tell us about Wall Street? What's the truth of trading? Trading was, a, was I love trading. Trading was in my blood. It was exciting. It was fun. It was stressful. And so I decided to give that up to do something even more stressful. How did that happen, though? You just woke up one day, or was this in a long time coming situation? Well, what happened was I decided to take a break from Wall Street for a time, and then uh, it was on my bucket list of things to do. So I got up one day and on a show, and then I apparently was okay, and I started getting a little, a little bit better, and the response was good enough where I decided, all right, let's give this a shot. Are you enjoying it more than trading? There's certain things I certainly miss about trading. I certainly miss a lot of the people I worked with, um, the day-to-day -day paychecks. <laughs> paychecks are very good. <laughs> what have been some of your better jokes? Well, I do a lot of stuff about myself. A lot about a lot of a lot of stuff about my background. My father's Indian. My mom is Filipino, and I grew up in Connecticut, so which means I'm white. <laughs> Where can we find you? We'd love to see you. Um, I have a website called therajmahal.com where I uh, put my schedule on. Well, I'm sure the 1% just adores you, Raj Mahal. Thanks for coming on our show today. Thanks, Angie. Deltacom, a trader's play on eBay. As that company heads to Splitsville, USA, Chart Talk is next. had a relatively low return for investors this year. Now comes word of the spinoff, Alan Nuckman of Bar Chart Bullseye Options. It's here to do some chart talk with us this morning. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, Angie. So what do you see in the charts for eBay? Well, first off, it's been a major laggard. Uh, the shine has come off of eBay, but I think this can spark that sector and really pay off for them. The stock is only up 2% over the last 52 weeks compared to the NASDAQ, which is up 25%. So I think there's a lot of upside, even though we saw a little bit of a bounce yesterday. What do you see as an options probability play here? Well, what I'm looking at is this stock has traded between 50 and 58 largely for the last year. So that target's 66, which is another 15% higher. So I'm looking at some more upside. The way I'm looking to play is my typical stock substitution play is buying an option instead of the stock. An April 50 call gives me the right to be long from 50, that low support level. And the break even's only about $1.50 higher with seven months for good things to happen. Where do you see this stock going beyond that? 
Well, I think it has a lot more upside, actually. I think Apple getting into this, this pay area really is going to lift that whole sector and, and unlock this profitability and show some growth here. If you look at eBay on a long-term basis, the lows, the highs, sorry, back in 2004 went all the way down to lows in 2009, five-year decline. We had a five-year full recovery. Now we're back approaching those highs at 58 once again. So it's a complete V formation, which is very encouraging and very bullish from a technical standpoint. Alan, thank you so much for helping us out on eBay today. That's a wrap for now. Coming up tomorrow in Movies and Money, our film critic will be here to explain why Netflix releasing its first major feature film could be a curse for Hollywood. From all of us at First Business, have a wonderful Wednesday. Thank you.